In our last episode, we discussed Henry IV's imagined stolen child, Hotspur. In this episode, let's focus on the son that was given to him by the fairies, uh, Hal. Now, it's hard to discern Hal without thinking about his two distinct father figures, Henry IV and Falstaff. Hal is a sort of an enigma in the same way his father was when he was Bolingbroke in Richard II. The best way to see Hal is through Henry and Falstaff, specifically their language. And the best scene is when Falstaff is deposed in their deposition scene. You caught that, right? It's when Falstaff plays Henry IV and Hal plays himself, and then there's a switch and Hal plays Henry IV, examining himself played as Falstaff. Do thou stand for me and I'll play my father. Falstaff, depose me? Those are reckless words. Those are dangerous, treasonous things to say, even in a joke. And Falstaff is always joking. And you also notice that he never speaks in verse, but only in prose. And whoever comes into contact with Falstaff likewise speaks in prose. This is a sign of his attraction. His deceiving, comical, braggadocio sort of way of speaking. Now you remember the scene. It happens right before his deposition. And mark my word, Falstaff will be deposed by Hal like Richard was deposed by Henry Bolingbroke. It's a long scene of almost 500 lines. It happens after the robbery. You remember the robbery. It's when Ponce, Falstaff, Pito, Bardoff, and Hal plan to rob a group of pilgrims heading to Canterbury. That's an allusion to the Canterbury Tales. Now, Hal worries about joining this group. Why? Because he's a prince. Hal is also like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. He's always aware of the social risks. But Ponce's plan is for a joke, right? And the entire joke is to hear Falstaff speak because Falstaff is all about language. The virtue of this chess will be the incomprehensible, boundless, unlimited lies that this same fat rogue will tell us when we meet at supper. And of course, that scene is funny too. I have peppered two of them. Two I am sure I have paid, two rogues in buckram suits. I tell thee what, Hal, if I tell thee a lie, spit in my face. Call me horse, thou knowest my old ward. Here I lay, and thus I bore my point. Four rogues in buckram, let drive at me. What, four? Thou saidest but two even now. Four, Hal, I told thee four. And to give me ground, but I followed me close. Came in foot in hand, and with a thought seven of the eleven I paid. Oh, monstrous. Eleven buckram men grown out of two. But as the devil would have it, three misbegotten knaves in Kendall Green came at my back and let drive at me. For it was so dark, Hal, that thou couldst not see thy hand. These lies are like their father that begets them. Gross as a mountain, that means big, open, palpable. Why, thou clay-brained guts, thou naughty-pated fool, thou whoresome, obscene, greasy, tallow catch. What, art thou mad? Art thou mad? Is not the truth the truth? Falstaff is utterly predictable. The lies come out of his head like Athena, the goddess of wisdom, came out of the head of her father Zeus. And remember also that Falstaff has no shame. And think again of Hotspur. Shame the devil, tell the truth. Falstaff is a devil figure. And what is worth pointing out in this scene is Hal's language. It mimics Falstaff's improvisations or extemporaneous playing. 
this sanguine coward, this bed presser, because he's so fat he squishes the bed, this horseback breaker, because he breaks horses, because he's so fat, this huge hill of flesh, so blood, you starveling, you eel skin, you dried neat's tongue, you bull's pizzle, you stockfish, oh, for breath to utter what is like thee, you tailor's yard, you sheath, you bow case, you vile standing tuck, well, breathe a while, and then to it again, and when thou hast tired thyself in base comparisons, hear me speak but this. These comical comparisons mark both their speech, but it's clearly under Falstaff's tutelage, which is why Henry IV worries about Hal. It would be interesting to look at Hal's reform from bum to king, in other words, as the prodigal son, through his change in language. Like, does his use of comparisons give way to less comical speech? Does prose give way to greater verse? Or, like any child raised in a certain environment, in this case, having two fathers, is his language mixed? And how are they mixed? What I've noticed about Hal's speech is that his prose is mixed with Henry's dignified blank verse, that means iambic pentameter without rhyme, on three occasions. The first one in his opening soliloquy, which was part of the dramatic arsenal under the influence of English translations of Seneca, as I've told you. Two, his true examination by his father. And three, when he's in battle, because warfare and battle at this period is a dignified art worthy of dignified speech, the high style. So let's look at the deposition. Falstaff suggests they play out a mock interview or examination between father and son. Now notice that Falstaff will be making an indirect appeal for his own worth. Shall the son of England prove a thief and take purses? A question to be asked. There is a thing, Harry, which thou hast often heard of, and it is known to many in our land by the name of Pitch. He's talking about black tar. This pitch, as ancient writers do report, doth defile. So doth the company thou keepest. For Harry, now I do not speak to thee in drink, but in tears, not in pleasure, but in passion, not in words only, but in woes also. And yet there is a virtuous man whom I have often noted in thy company, but I know not his name. What manner of man? And it like your majesty, a good portly man, I faith, and a copulent, of a cheerful look, a pleasing eye, and the most noble carriage. And as I think, his age some fifty, or by lady inclining to threescore, that's sixty. And now I remember him, his name is Falstaff. If that man should be lewdly given, he deceiveth me, for Harry, I see virtue in his looks. If then the tree may be known by the fruit, as the fruit by the tree, then peremptorily I speak it. There is virtue in that false staff. Him keep with, the rest banish. That's false staff, aware that Hal will be king. False staff, for all his bragging, is aware that their time together must come to an end. Hal is thinking of his future and his self-reform. Remember the opening soliloquy where he basically tells us that this is that he's now about to change or is in the process of changing? And he's looking upon his old friend, his unreformable friend, with love, pity, a sense of coming dread, and Falstaff. I think there's love 
but also expectations for something to be gained. Like he senses his fortune and his Lord's graces are about to flow away from him. Depose me, if thou dost it half so gravely, so majestically, both in word and matter, hang me up by the heels for a rabbit sucker or a polter hare. This image of being hung like at the butcher shop, like a r bunny or a rabbit, I'm not thinking of Easter coming up Sunday, or a dead hare along East Cheap, which was a meat market in London, will come about for Bardoff and Henry V, when Hal must, in the end, rid himself of his past once and for all. Well, here I am set, and here I stand. Judge, my masters. Now they've switched places. Falstaff has been deposed. Think of Fortune's Wheel. They're playing out in their improvised play, Richard II as farce. Hal is now his father. And that transformation will happen at the end of the play when he identifies with his father's position as king. So this is Hal playing his dad before he becomes his dad. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. A ton of man is thy companion. Why dost thou converse with that trunk of humors, or excess, that bolting hutch of beastliness, that swollen parcel of dropsies, that huge bombard of sack, that stuffed cloak bag of guts, that roasted manning tree ox with the pudding in his belly, that reverend vice, that gray iniquity, that father ruffian, that vanity in years. Wherein is he good but to taste sack and drink it? Wherein neat and cleanly but to carve a cape and eat it? Wherein cunning but in craft? Wherein crafty but in villainy? Wherein villainous but in all things? Wherein worthy but in nothing? I would your grace would take me with you. Who means your grace? That villainous, abominable misleader of youth, Falstaff, that old, white-bearded Satan. Hal's description of Falstaff then becomes theatrical. He becomes the Satan or vice of medieval morality and mystery plays. It also makes Falstaff bigger than life and also more attractive. This leads to one of Shakespeare's most cherished passages, Falstaff's defense of himself. And he uses all of his rhetorical devices, including pity and paradiastole, which is where you turn a vice into a virtue. Falstaff is trying to avoid the inevitable. Falstaff as Hal, but that he is, saving your reverence, a whoremaster, that I utterly deny. If sack and sugar be a fault, God help the wicked. If to be old and merry be a sin, then many an old host that I know is damned. If to be fat be to be hated, then Pharaoh's lean kine are to be loved. No, my good Lord. Banish pedo, banish bardoff, banish poins. But for sweet Jack Falstaff, kind Jack Falstaff, true Jack Falstaff, valiant Jack Falstaff, and therefore more valiant being as he is, old Jack Falstaff, banish not him thy Harry's company, banish not him thy Harry's company, banish plump Jack, and banish all the world. I do, I will. Both know it's happening, and both know it will happen. In the next episode, we're gonna look at deceptive discourses in both Henry IV and in Hal. All right guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.